So, um, good morning. Um, we had um, started uh, by uh, saying a few basic things on um, path iron, uh, in particular reminding you that uh, there are two, it's, it's, it's polymorphic, you have two forms of iron that are, are relevant, is a ferrite and austenite, and austenite is the high temperature form. Um, the, um, although, so, so this one here uh, uh, will, will, will transform to uh, ferrite as you cool down. There is um, another form, polymorphic uh, form of iron, which is called epsilon iron, which is hexagonal, also exists, but that exists at very high temperature. Temperatures, and, and you um, uh, only um, encounter it in, in relatively highly alloyed uh, steels. So most steels, it's, it's not really relevant. Um, but in pure iron, you really need huge pressures to, uh, to see it. Okay. Um, these um, crystal structures are very different. They have very different properties, um, going from elastic modulus all the way to diffusion constants. In, in these uh, two phases are different. Um, mechanical properties are different, yes? Um, and um, let's see. Uh, in pure iron, this transformation from, from high temperature austenite to, to low temperature ferrite is at 912 degrees, so it's pretty high temperature. Um, we encounter this transformation uh, in almost all uh, steel processing. Mm -hmm. As soon as you um, are around this uh, temperature, close to 900, of course, it depends on, on composition, the transformation will, will occur. Mm -hmm. So this is an example, for instance, of where it happens in, uh, in, uh, in the hot strip mill. Mm -hmm. This is the rolling mill. You can see the strip coming out. Um, this is the, the so-called finishing finisher, the finishing stands here in a, in a hot strip mill. You see here the, the hot strip. When it comes out of this mill, it goes into what is called a runout table. We'll discuss this in more detail as, as we go in. And that's where it's cooled, yes, uh, before it's coiled. And here you see this uh, coiled strip. Hmm? Uh, so the rolling uh, is done be at around 1,000 to uh, 800 and close to 900 degrees C, yes. Then um, the cooling here, you cool this strip that comes out at around 900 degrees C to, to anywhere from 700 to 500 degrees C, and, uh, and then you cool it, and obviously... Um, the transformation from the high temperature uh, austenite yeah. that you roll here to uh, uh, ferritic uh, microstructure in the coil strip um, will occur in this here. Yeah. Um, so what, what happens basically, if we look at very simple steels, the, uh, uh, not much alloyed, yes. Um, so first of all, you, you look at the temperature as a function of time. Um, so the, the, the thermal uh, uh, pattern that you see is that so uh, you come, that's the red line here. You have two segments, a, a segment which goes down rapidly, and then a segment that goes down very slowly. And segment that goes down rapidly, that's the one corresponding to this runout table. Yeah? And the one that goes very, very, very slowly corresponds to the, 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 the part of the thermal treatment where the cooling is very slow. That's in the coiled strip. Yes? Uh, so typical cooling rates here will be of the order of 10 to 30 degrees second. Here it will be 
20 degrees per hour. Right? So very, very different cooling rates. Yeah? So, um, but, um, so as, as you cool, there is a temperature here, yes, where, where this transformation, right? where, where this structure goes into, goes into this structure. Yeah? And this doesn't happen instantly. This happens uh, as follows. So you have these grains of austenite here. You can see a grain of austenite. And at the rim of this grain, the transformation starts. You see these, these, these white, little white things here? Those are the grains of this phase that, that start to grow. And eventually, they will replace uh, this austenite, this black phase here. Yeah? And that happens. There's certain kinetics involved in this. Yeah? These kinetics are uh, a function of the composition uh, uh, of the steel in particular. And this transformation here from austenite to ferrite, we call this decomposition, the austenite decomposition. And why do we, we, we say decomposition? Because depending on what um, uh, cooling pattern you use, you can get different microstructure. Uh, you can have uh, something that's ferritic, or you can have microstructure that contains perlite, etc. We'll see that in more detail. So that's why we say um, composition of austenite. Okay. All right, so um, obviously uh, the crystal structure yes, of your steel doesn't look like this. Yeah? And the reason is because you, you have we're dealing with iron alloys, yes? and there will be two types of elements in this alloy. There will be interstitial atoms, yes? Uh, so these are uh, small uh, carbon atom and nitrogen atom, uh, which um, will uh, occupy uh, positions in, the, in, this, in this unit cell that are uh, that coincide with um, lattice positions. This doesn't coincide with iron positions. Yeah. Um, they will uh, distort the lattice by their presence, mm -hmm. um, and they um, will also, as do most uh, alloying additions, influence the stability of the two phases. Yes. And they will also influence the kinetics of this austenite decomposition. That's really important. They do something to the lattice mechanically. They'll distort it. They distort the lattice. They also influence the thermodynamic stability of the two uh, polymorphic forms of iron. Yes, And they influence the kinetics. They influence the transformation. Now, one of the things that's interesting to see is compare uh, uh, the uh, look at the size of the atoms you can put here in the in these um, interstices um, and compare this to the uh, diameter of the iron atom. So you see, uh, if you you do that, you see that. Um, these interstices are, are very small in comparison to the size of these atoms. And the reason why they, it does, they look very big here is because I've made these atoms smaller so you can see the structure. Yes, That's not the real size of the iron atoms. The iron atoms are very big and they kind of touch each other. Yeah? So I just made them smaller so you can see the crystal structure. So very small. Uh, diameter is available. In the case, this is for BCC. In the case of FCC, if you look carefully here, you can see that the size of the uh, interstices are about uh, three times as large. Yeah? So about close to 0.45. Yeah? So as a consequence, um, if we put a carbon or a nitrogen atom in these interstices, um, there will be a lot of distortion, of local distortion of the lattice. And the lattice distortion in BCC is extremely high. And it's so high that 
it has an, a huge impact on solubility of carbon in BCC. It's extremely low. In fact, uh, carbon is probably uh, insoluble in BCC iron. Yes? Uh, and nitrogen also. Because, uh, because the lattice strain is so huge. Uh, in comparison, um, the lattice strain in um, uh, FCC iron, so the high temperature form of iron, is uh, much smaller. And um, the solubility of carbon in FCC iron, so in the high temperature form of um, uh, iron, is actually um, uh, relatively high. The, we, up to two weight percent of carbon can be dissolved in gamma iron. What, ha what does this mean is that uh, many steels contain carbon as an alloying element. We'll see that. And, and so when you transform the high temperature to the low temperature form of iron, there's, there's going to be a, a very high driving force to um, uh, get the carbon out of the BCC lattice and form carbides. Okay. Uh, another uh, thing, just uh, for your information, how do we know that the carbon is sitting in these particular octahedral interstices? We know this from other uh, 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 material science experiments that have been done in the past decades. And so we know where the carbon sits in these, uh, there, because there are many other interstices uh, in the lattice, but it, uh, that's, where they, that's where they like to sit. Okay, so this is what this distortion. So when, if uh, this is this octahedral uh, interstices, you can see the form of the octahedron. Yeah? Um, and uh, if you put an interstitial atom in it, you get a very large lattice distortion. Yes, and this lattice distortion is actually observed when you take austenite, yes, and you quench it very rapidly. Then the carbon doesn't have uh, the opportunity to form carbides or get away from the lattice and then you can observe this distortion and this distortion is tetragonal gives a tetragonal distortion of the lattice okay okay so we have um, alloying additions which um, such as carbon and nitrogen yes um, that are in the in interstitial interstitial positions um, there are other atoms, yeah, such as chrome, moly, manganese, silicon, phosphorus, aluminum, etc. These atoms will sit, they will substitute for iron in the lattice. Yes. And again, just like the case of carbon and nitrogen, they will have, they will distort the lattice locally because they may be larger or smaller than iron, so there will be a change in um, the, um, the, the local change in, in the lattice, uh, strain in the lattice as you add these elements to the um, um, uh, iron to make a steel. It will, they will also have an impact on the relative stability of the austenite and ferrite. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they will also influence the kinetics of the austenite decomposition. So how fast does the austenite decompose into ferrite or other constituents. Um, for instance, when you add chrome, moly, uh, uh, manganese, uh, these atoms are slightly larger, so you get a small lattice expansion locally. Yeah? Um, you can have a lattice contraction if you put in uh, silicon, aluminum, lattice contraction. Yeah? Uh, and so, uh, as, again, as I said, uh, it impacts the stability and the kinetics. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so it may be interesting if you, for you to remember that uh, chrome and manganese have slightly the same um, uh, lattice parameter than, than iron. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very close in the periodic table, so they're 
close to the same. But um, another important alloying element, such as moly, is, is a much it's a much larger atom. So it gives a lot more uh, lattice distortion. Okay. So um, so when once we start adding uh, alloying elements, um, uh, they will have an impact on the. Uh, the, the stability of the uh, austenite and, and ferrite, and you may get other phases, yes, at different temperatures, yes, um, and, uh, and and so you need a tool to um, be able to describe what happens when you add an, an alloy element. So and then we'll use phase diagram as a tool to determine the phases, the number of phases that are present, the, what phases are present, the composition of the phases, um, the phase fractions at different temperatures and compositions, and we'll also identify interesting microstructures such as uh, lamellar microstructures and this famous one that you know that is in, occurs in the iron carbon system, that's perlite. Um, and, and we're interesting in knowing all these things because the microstructure influences, for instance, the mechanical properties. And this is um, the iron-carbon phase diagram, which I, I assume all of you know, uh, and, and which we will use. So, for instance, uh, I just want to point out to... Okay. So... Um, you know uh, that this is the austenite stability field, yes? Um, and this, in this field we have ferrite plus what, what I usually write down as theta. Theta is just uh, cementite, yes? Um, so uh, what you see is normally here at about 912, yes? 912 degrees C, yes. Um, the austenite uh, transformed to ferrite as um, if we have pure iron. So pure iron is along this, this line here on this uh, diagram, yes. And you see, for instance, that um, as we add carbon, yes, uh, the, uh, the 912 uh, decreases to a lower temperature, yes? So that means that um, addition of carbon uh, changes the relative stability of ferrite and austenite. It's, it tends to stabilize uh, austenite. Hmm? Okay. And there are elements that do just the, the, the reverse. Yeah? Okay. Okay. This is... Um, so, um, we can, uh, with this phase diagram, determine the, in particular, in this, the iron carbon phase diagram, determine the fraction of austenite, ferrite, and cementite uh, at any type, temperature, and composition. For instance, say I have, um, say I have carbon content, say is, 6.67% in weight. I have an alloy that consists of that, yes. And um, I'm interested at a temperature of 200 degrees C. So my question to you is, uh, what is the, uh, what is the um, fraction of austenite, ferrite, and cementite in that particular alloy? Well, first of all, uh, I need to draw a line at 200 degrees C, yes? Yes? So I see here that I'm definitely somewhere in the region where I will have ferrite and cementite, yes? And then I look up on my uh, x-axis, 6.67, so this is 6, 6.67 is, is right here, yes? Yes, this point, and the phase diagram tells me that I have pure cementite. Yes, so uh, this alloy 
uh, is actually not really an alloy, it's a compound. It's, it's um, the carbide of iron. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's 100%, so this means in, in this particular situation for this alloy, it'll be 100% um, Fe3C. Okay. okay. There is so that's an interesting point to know. There's another interesting point that um, um, we uh, look at is uh, this point here. Yeah. This point here is is the uh, it's a eutectoid. Yes. Uh, if I have a composition eutectoid composition. Hmm? I have, I will have a transformation of austenite to a mixture of ferrite plus cementite. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, is, is the way the transformation happens. It gives me a, mi a lamellar microstructure which we call perlite. Yes? And in the iron carbon system, uh, this is approximately, I'd, if I'm right, my memory serves me, it's approximately 0.8%. All right. This uh, particular point, yes, um, uh, occurs at around uh, 720 degrees here. Yes, 720 degrees, and at, as I said, about 0.8 percent of carbon. Yes, but as soon as you add um, other elements to your steel, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this uh, the position of this this uh, eutectoid point can change can change uh, a lot actually. Yeah? For instance, if you add titanium, this eutectoid temperature uh, decreases a lot. Yeah? If you add nickel, it decreases also, but slightly less. Yeah? So. Um, um, and, and most elements will reduce this temperature. Yes, will reduce this temperature. Okay, and then this is experimentally what uh, you measure. Uh, you add, that, uh, add one of these elements, the, this uh, eutectoid temperature uh, decreases. Um, the other thing that happens is that uh, the um, uh, the composition of the eutectoid point also changes. Yeah? And uh, so what, excuse me, what, uh, uh, sorry, I, I um, got a little bit uh, carried away. I wasn't paying attention. This, this is the eutectoid uh, composition. So as you add um, elements, it moves to the left, yeah, to lower values, yes. and. Um, it also, ch the temperature changes, yes, the temperature changes uh, as you add elements, yes, and certain elements, so this is about 720 here, yes, 720 degrees C, uh, certain elements will uh, increase the, uh, this uh, temperature, other elements will decrease it. So, for instance, uh, with, with uh, titanium, you'll have a, a very, very strong increase. Silicon also. So that basically means that instead of having this downward slope here, the, the slope may even increase as you add uh, titanium or um, elements like this um, that have similar effects as titanium. So these elements that increase this um, uh, eutectoid temperature, titanium, moly, chrome, vanadium, we call them ferrite stabilizer or alpha stabilizing elements. Stabilizing elements. Whereas elements that reduce this temperature, yes, we call them austenite stabilizer or gamma stabilizers. And uh, you can see why that, that would be. Uh, elements that re, um, uh, reduce the uh, uh, eutectoid temperature will increase the austenite stability range, yes, 
and, uh, and so they, they stabilize austenite. That's why we call them stabilizers, austenite stabilizer or gamma stabilizing elements. Okay. Right. Um, so wh what, what is important for us in this whole phase diagram, yes, is, is actually only this part. Yeah? We, we, we really don't work with this part. Yes. So only up to about to weight percent. Uh, that's point number one. And that many of the steels we deal with um, are actually in in this neighborhood. So at on the iron rich side of the phase diagram. Yes. Okay. Um, let's learn some vocabulary here. So. Um, we already know a few things. We know that this point is called the eutectoid point. We know it's about 0.8. Actually, it's be more exact, it's 0.77. And the temperature is around 0.20 to 0.27 in this particular uh, uh, case. Hmm? Um, and um, so we have the eutectoid point. And so we say uh, of steels that contain less than 0.77 carbon, that they're hypoeutectoid. Yeah. Hypo means less than the eutectoid composition. If, if you're above this, we, we say they're hypereutectoid. Yes? Okay. So basically, we have two types of steels hyper and hypoeutectoid steels. Okay, right. So if if we are very very close to the y-axis, yes, we will only see in in the microstructure we will basically see only ferrite. Yeah, okay, ferrite. And this is ferrite. That means this is your phase diagram here. Compositions that are very close to this to this red dot, yes, um, are um, ferritic steels. They're a particular type of uh, hypoeutectoid steels. And there's not much to see, yes? And there are many steels uh, that basically look like that. Okay? All right. So, uh, so we're talking about steels that are in this neighborhood, yes? And in order, in order to actually see or be able to describe what is going on in these steels, I have to blow this up a lot. Yes? Yes. And so if I blow this up, so this, this is 0.5, yes? I, I magnify this 10 times. So now I go from 0 0.0 to 0 0.05. So that 0 0.05... Um, 0.05 percent of carbon, yes. Um, so this corresponds to um, what we call 500 ppm of carbon, hmm? 500 weight ppm of carbon. Hmm? Corresponds to so that um, so that's. Uh, so that's 500 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, uh, um, 500 over uh, yes a million So, uh, so, so this is five times ten to the minus four. Yes, that's the the weight fraction. So this um, a steel that um, contains five hundred ppm of carbon in weight ppm means that there are um, like five hundred grams of carbon for every million. Um, uh, grams of the material, as it were. Right? So that's 5 times 10 to the minus 4. It's the weight fraction, yes? 
And, and so if I want to uh, do it in percentage, uh, I multiply by 100. So that gives me uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 2. Yeah. And, and, and so this is the, the weight percentage, 0.05. Okay, so you can use uh, either weight percents that's used very often in this in the industry. Uh, you can also say 500 ppm. Yes. Uh, scientifically, we like to use um, uh, mole fractions. Yes, or uh, atomic percent things like this. So you, 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 you see uh, different ways of uh, presenting things. In general, the industry will, will list um, weight, weight percentage. So if we blow up this corner here, um, we, we, we see that um, something we can't see really here is now that we have a region here, uh, a region where we see, uh, this is ferrite, yeah, ferrite, which contains carbon in solid solution. Yes. Yeah. So, and we we can see that we can also see what the maximum solubility is of carbon in uh, iron, and it's it's about 200 ppm. 200 ppm. So 200 ppm is 0.02 percent. Uh, so that's the maximum solubility of carbon in ferrite. In austenite, the maximum solubility is here. Yes, you see here. I can, I can add carbon up to two percent. Yes. And um, I still have homogeneous austenite, and, and, um, so two percent. So one, two. So it's 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 a, a very large difference in in solubility. The solubility itself of of carbon in uh, in ferrite is is actually given by this line here. This line here is actually the solubility line. Yes? This is the solubility line for carbon in ferrite. Yeah? And you can see, for instance, if, if uh, at, uh, uh, well, let's have a look here, at 600 degrees C, the solubility is at 600 degrees C, the solubility is 0.005% carbon. So that corresponds to 50 ppm carbon. So it, as we reduce the temperature, uh, the uh, driving force for uh, uh, pushing the carbon out of the um, um, lattice is very high. You don't have to come to class, right? Don't have to come, because we're taping the class anyway. But if you come to class, please don't text, okay? And if you want to text, you can just go text, do whatever you want, you know, attend the lecture whenever you want, but just don't play around with your mobile phone. Because Okay. Um, all right. So um, there you go. So the, uh, and um, so, so yes, as I said, uh, uh, and many steels are in this um, uh, type of uh, carbon content ranges. Yes. So when we when we talk about low carbon steels, um, you know that's the kind of um, carbon contents uh, we're dealing with. All right. Okay, so let's now um, increase the carbon content up to the 
uh, uh, eutectoid uh, composition here and, um, and describe a little bit these, um, the, the, the microstructure we, we observe uh, when we cool down uh, austenite with this 0.77% of carbon, yes. Uh, so after, uh, at room temperature, this is what, what we observe. These, um, this is a lamellar microstructure where you have alternating layers of ferrite and cementite, and we call this, this, this is perlite. So perlite is not um, a phase, Yes, it's not a phase, it's just two phases um, that, um, uh, uh, that result from the transformation of austenite. Yes? Um, and the way the transformation uh, occurs is by this lamellar growth. Uh, so, but but it's, 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 a, it's a two phase microstructure. So, um, uh, Things like uh, bainite or martensite or perlite, they're not new phases, right? Uh, uh, they're just, and in order to describe them, uh, we can't use the word phase. We, we say constituents. Yeah. So try to use constituents um, in the, uh, when, when you're describing these, um, uh, these constituents, yes. All right, so, okay. If, if, if we go beyond this 2% here, um, the, the, these alloys are very important, yeah, they, uh, uh, but they, they form a class of alloys that we do not discuss in, in this class, and, and those are called cast irons. Right? Cast irons. Um, and this is an example of um, a cast iron here, um, which contain um, nodular graphite, um, very interesting material, but we, 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 so we're not talking about alloys with carbon uh, uh, more than two percent. All right. Now, uh, many steels are are basically um, uh, iron carbon alloys. Yes, and. Um, Depending on the amount of carbon we, we have in the alloy, we'll get a different phase fraction of ferrite and cementite. Yes? The problem is um, when you look at the microstructural level, you don't see ferrite grains and austenite, excuse me, ferrite grains and cementite grains separately. What you see is ferrite and perlite. Hmm? It means the, the, the cementite forms perlite together with a fraction of the, um, uh, the um, ferrite phase. So for instance here, um, you can see this is a situation where uh, the, say the matrix is our ferrite grains, and in this matrix you have quite a lot of perlite. If I increase the perlite content more, I, I get a situation where the matrix is perlite, yes. and then there's a little bit of another phase in here, which is cementite, little blocks of cementite at this grain boundaries. But basically, we're still dealing with ferrite and, and cementite, yes, except but the microstructure is different because of the eutectoid transformation. So let's have a look at um, uh, trying to understand these microstructures. So um, we, uh, we go, so, so the phase diagram tells you if you go from high temperature to low temperature, okay, so at a high temperature you always have austenite and then we, when you cool down, the phase diagram tells you you will have ferrite and cementite. Yes? And, and depending on the composition, uh, you will have different phase fractions. Yes? But what you actually get in, uh, uh, in the microstructure is, is actually more complex. 
So let's l have a look at uh, what you get if you have hypoeutectoid steel, so less than this about 0.8% of uh, carbon. Okay. Um, you have, this is an example here, for 0.2%. Hmm? You uh, form ferrite, yes, and then ferrite matrix, and then in there you have perlite. Hmm? As I increase the carbon content, I get more perlite. Yeah? You can see here from 0.2 to 0.5, I get much larger uh, pools, as it were, of perlite. Okay? If I go beyond the eutectoid point, things are different. If I go beyond here, uh, when I cool down the austenite, uh, and I pass this line here, this line, yes, uh, I go into the stability range where you have austenite plus cementite. Yeah. So I, the first phase to form uh, on this microstructure here is this, at the grain boundaries of the austenite, I form cementite. Yes, cementite. And so this is the primary cementite. Don't form very much, yes. And then as I cool down below 727, whatever hasn't uh, transformed becomes perlite. Hmm? Again, that's why you get these very large perlite grains, yes. But the first phase to form is this cementite. As, as is in this particular case, when you cool down, the first phase to form is ferrite, okay? Okay, so, so if in more detail here, uh, uh, 0.10%, 0 0.37, 0 0.55, 0 0.8, you can see as I go from left to right, gradually the, 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 the ferrite grains are replaced by perlite constituents. Yes, and eventually at uh, uh, 0.8, everything is perlitic. Hmm? Okay. Okay, and this is the, this, this uh, typical microstructure. Uh, and you can see very nicely uh, these alternating layers. Um, th this is not um, uh, a, a stable microstructure. Many, many microstructures that we, uh, that we have in steels are not stable microstructures. This is one of them. You can, we'll see in a moment that you can change this microstructure. Uh, the reason why it's not stable, it's because it, it has a very high energy. Uh, there are lots of interfaces here. And that um, is, is uh, the reason why um, you have uh, high energy. Okay, but let's now um, concentrate on this uh, particular microstructure. Uh, to try to uh, introduce um, the, uh, some concepts about kinetics of transformations. So we'll, we will look at this particular transformation yes, from austenite to this mixture of ferrite plus cementite, which we call uh, perlite. So normally this, this uh, transformation should occur at this eutectoid temperature, 727, yes. But what we can do is I can uh, say I have, have a furnace, yes, and I have a furnace at 800 degrees C, yes, and I can uh, put my material, my steel, in that furnace for a while till it's at 800 degrees C. So I have this composition of 800 degrees C, yes. I, um, it's homo the, the phase diagram tells me it's homogeneously austenite, yes. And then I have another furnace next to it. And so and that furnace can be, for instance, 650. So I take my sample and I put it in that furnace. Yeah? That what I'm doing is an isothermal transformation. Yes? So the, at 650, 
the austenite not stable anymore, and I, and I will get a transformation, a, transfer, a formation of perlite now, yes, at 650 degrees C, yes, and I can. Um, so, so the difference between um, the eutectoy temperature and the temperature at which I do the transformation uh, is called the undercooling. I can have a, a very large undercooling. I can go at uh, have a furnace where I do the transformation at 400 degrees C or at 300 degrees C. I can quench my sample. Yes. So I can change the undercooling and look at the kinetics of the transformations. There are many ways in which we can look at the kinetics of the transformation. Uh, yes. But say we have a way to do this transformation and follow the progress of the perlite formation at different temperatures. Um, in the laboratory, you can do this in a very simple way. Um, you can do this a very simple way. Um, you take a small sample of your steel, yes, and uh, you measure the length. The, the length of your of that steel. Yes. You can do this at high temperature. You just need some uh, uh, some kind of gauge that will measure the the length. Yes. And um, and you cool the material to uh, a uh, a lower temperature. So so what happens when you cool material? It shrinks, right? Thermal, thermal uh, expansion, thermal contraction, yes. Uh, so it's all shrink. It gets a little bit. So if this is the original uh, material, so it will shrink uh, because of thermal contraction. But something else will happen, of course, because I will transform austenite to ferrite and cementite, right? And so what happens there is that the lattice, the cement, the, excuse me, the austenite lattice is a very dense lattice. It has a very high atomic density. When we transform to ferrite, the lattice is uh, much less dense. Yeah? So the same amount of atoms has a larger volume in ferrite. In, a, in other words, your sample expands because of the transformation. Hmm? So there is a thermal contraction, but there is a lot of so this, uh, this is this contraction due to the um, uh, thermal contraction, and there is an expansion due to the transformation, to the transformation austenite to ferrite plus uh, cementite. And you can just follow this. You can just measure. Yeah. And by tracking that, you can, you can get the kinetics of the transformation very simply. Okay. So if you do this, right, what you find is that when this, let me go back here, right, when this undercooling, this is the delta T, yes, when this undercooling is uh, large, you get this green line, transformation. If I reduce the undercooling, instead of doing transformation at 600 degrees C, I do it at 650, the transformation is slower. In other words, it takes more time to get the transformation to finish. If I do it at 7, 675, the undercooling is even less. Transformation is small, is, is slower again. Yeah? Okay. Yep. Uh, let me go, let me just go back here. So what controls the, the growth of the perlite? The growth of the perlite? Well, the two things is 
carbon redistribution. The carbon doesn't like to be in the ferrite because there's no solubility, yes? So it will form cementite. So it's got to diffuse away from the ferrite that forms, yes? Okay, so that it takes uh, time. Okay, but there is another aspect, yes? Uh, so the, the carbon diffusion is related to the, the growth of the uh, cementite. The other uh, aspect is nucleation, yes? Okay, so the, the process of transformation, uh, the formation of perlite, is a process of, that we call a process of nucleation and growth. And there are many transformations that um, happen by this process. So, so what happens here? So when I look into detail in this S-curve of transformation kinetics, yes, um, I have a nucleation stage. And then the particle grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Eventually, um, it cannot grow indefinitely because the volume that transform is limited and then um, at one time these uh, growing perlite islands will start Im impinging on each other right so and, and that's why you you get this s type of curve yes that, that the the kinetics as you read saturation uh, slow down hmm? okay so you you have a phase of nucleation, growth, and then saturation. So, what we uh, find when we look, usually when we look at uh, nucleation and growth processes, is that the rate of nucleation is high when the undercooling is large. So when you carry out the transformation at lower temperatures, the rate of nucleation is high. The growth stage, this growth stage here, the growth stage is higher at higher temperature. That is at small undercoolings. Okay, and then you have the impingement stage, which, which is basically... Um, um, a, a, you know, a normal uh, result of the, the growth stage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why is the nucleation, uh, in the nucleation stage, do you get a large rate of nucleation when the temperature, you do the transformation at low temperature? That's because the driving force is large. The driving force, what's the, what's the driving force in the transformation is the difference in stability between austenite and ferrite. Right? Um, if I have a phase transformation, yes. so this is austenite. Say, look, just let's just look at pure austenite and ferrite. Yes, uh, this phase has a certain stability. Yes, and you know that we can uh, represent the stability of a phase by means of their free energy, yes? And, uh, and the ferrite also has a free energy, right? Oops. And, uh, okay. and the free energy is a function of temperature and, and composition. And if it's a pure substance, it's only a function of temperature. Uh, so, so if I do, if this is a temperature axis, by the way. Yeah? So if I do a transformation very close to the uh, to the, the, the transformation temperature, the driving force will be small. Yes. If if I at this temper at this temperature, the driving force is zero, right? Because they're equally stable. Hmm? Hmm? The driving force is basically the difference between the free energies. Hmm? Hmm? But the lower I get the more stable 
ferrite becomes relative to the austenite. Yeah? And so we say the driving force for the transformation is higher. Yeah? As we, and this, this would be the undercooling, delta T, yeah? if the undercooling becomes larger, the driving force for the transformation is higher. Yes? And that has an impact on the nucleation. If I have a high driving force, I'll have lots of nuclei, nuclei for the transformation. Okay? So that explains. In the growth stage, we're dealing with redistribution of atoms. The carbon atom has to, has to move away from the ferrite into the, the cementite, so that takes time. But that's controlled by the diffusivity of carbon. So this, so this is controlled by uh, the difference in free energies. Yes. This is controlled by the diffusion. In this particular case, the diffusion of carbon. Yes. Okay. Okay. So these two processes. Yes. Um, of we usually like to say, well, it's a nucleation and growth process, but it's not like there's a nucleation process and then after the nucleation process there's a growth process. No, it's, the two processes happen at the same time. Hmm? So let's just um, show you what I mean. So you have a nucleation rate, which is the number of nuclei you form per unit time per unit volume, and you have a growth rate, which is the basically the increase in the radius of the nuclei with time. So if you start with a unit volume, say, of austenite, right, beginning at time zero, at certain temperature, after a certain time, you form, for instance, two nuclei in this unit volume. And this would be two nuclei of, of, um, of perlite yeah, phase. Okay? Okay? All nuclei of perlite phase. And then... At 2 delta T, uh, these nuclei have grown to a certain radius, yes? Which is, the radius is the growth rate times the, the time step, okay? And, and, and so, and, and, but in that same time, you have added two nuclei, yes? Because the nucleation rate is, uh, remains the same. And then the next step, the original nuclei have grown again. The second stage nuclei have increased their radius, and you have added two more nuclei. So that's, that's the process. You have nucleation and growth occur at the same time. Okay? So if, if, I, if I show now what's happening, so if we have... Uh, uh, do the transformation very close to the eutectoid temperature, we get a low rate of nucleation because there's not much driving force, yes? But we have a high uh, growth rate because diff diffusion is easier at higher temperatures. Yeah? And uh, at very low temperatures, when we do the transformation at very low temperatures, the nucleation rate is very high. I have a lot of driving force, but my diffusivity is low, so I get growth rate is low. And in, in between, it's intermediate growth rate and intermediate uh, nucleation rate, and that's usually where we get the maximum transformation rate. Yes? Because the transformation rate is a product of growth and nucleation. So here, the transformation will be slow because I don't nucleate much. Here, I will nucleate a lot, but the, the nuclei cannot grow, right? So um, what you want to have, because the transformation is, real, is the product of growth times nucleation, yes? You basically, are, it's best, best off, you get the highest transformation rate where nucleation and growth rate are intermediate. 
So, so if this is delta T, yes, and this is the, the growth rate and the nucleation rate, hmm? so uh, this would be the temperature is the eutectoid temperature. So at uh, low delta T, I have a very high growth rate, yes, high growth rate, yes, but a low nucleation rate, yes, because I have no driving force, yes. So the transformation rate is related to the product of both, yes. So if I make the product of n dot g dot, yes, it's low here, yes, it goes up, and then it decreases again because my growth rate is, yeah. So, so this is where I have, I have a maximum growth, a uh, transformation, excuse me, transformation. A maximum transformation rate. And that's basically where um, both nucleation and growth are not very extreme. Okay? So this information that we have now um, our measure transformation uh, uh, fraction as a function of time, yes? I can, uh, I have these, this curve here for many different temperatures, yes? And uh, all this data I can squeeze into a single graph which we call the TTT curve, yes? So, uh, that is a curve where we have temperature as a function of time. And now the green points yes, are is the points where the transformation starts. So I, for instance, if this is a transformation here at 675, 675, this is one point on this graph. That's the point where transformation starts. The black point is transformation 50%. Red point is transformation finished, yes? Okay, and if I connect now on all, for all the temperature, these, the green points, I get the green curve, which gives me the eutectoid transformation start curve, yes? And this is the black one, is 50% transformed, 100% transformed. So you see here that the maximum transformation rate for perlite formation will be at around 550, yes? And it will be extremely rapid. The transformation will start within one second and will be finished within 10 seconds, yes? However, um, if I'm very close to this uh, 727, yes? Yes, for, we're in 675. The transformation will only start after 20 seconds, yes, and will take maybe 500 seconds to finish, yes. So depending on the temperature, I get very different transformation. Rate, yeah? However, the general rule is, uh, excuse me, the general. Uh, um, yeah. Conclusion of this type of studies is that uh, uh, nucleation and growth uh, transformation curves are always C-type curves. C-type curves. Mm -hmm. If you're close to the transformation, uh, start, uh, um, excuse me, the, uh, in this case, the eutectoid temperature, the transformation can be very slow. At lower temperature, you get the same thing. Uh, it takes longer time to, uh, to transform because you have very low growth rates. And the reason why you have low growth is because diffusivity is very low. Okay, so this is what happens. At uh, 675, you start the transformation. So for the, the, this, this first, uh, first 20 seconds, nothing happens basically. The nucleation uh, starts, you get growth. Yes, and eventually everything is perlitic after about 500 seconds. Okay. There is um, 
Also, one thing that happens, and I, I want to mention it here, is um, when you do the, um, the transformation, uh, there is also, you also change the morphology a little bit of the perlite. As you reduce the temperature of the transformation, the, the, the perlite is, is, gets finer. The, what we call the interlamellar spacing, the, la the, the spacing between the ferrite la lamella or the, the, the uh, cementite lamella is decreased. Hmm? So this we call coarse perlite, this we call fine perlite. And, and, uh, okay. Now, what happens now so we, I, I've shown you here that uh, at about 550, the transformation is um, very rapid to perlite. Um, but what happens if um, I go below there? Yes, I've, I've told you uh, just a moment ago, well, I'd, I would still get perlite, but it'd go very slowly. And that's not really correct, because there's one other thing that happens is as you reduce the temperature, yes, the um, diffusivity starts to, to drop considerably. Yeah? In fact, the diffusivity of substitutional elements yes, uh, becomes uh, close to zero. The, the substitutional elements are, have a much lower diffusivity than the interstitial elements. Uh, why would that be? Well, think about an interstitial element. It sits in an interstitial position, yes? And it can hop from one interstitial position to another one. Yeah? A substitutional element needs to have a vacancy in, its, in the neighborhood. So you need to have an atom has to be absent on the other lattice plane, yes? So you need to form um, um, or to have um, vacancies for diffusion of substitutional element. So the uh, substitutional diffusion is, is very strongly uh, reduced. Um, and you get other microstructures. You get other microstructures, and one, the microstructure that you get is, is this one, it's bainite. Yes. Bainite is formed in conditions where there's only, only uh, interstitial diffusion and no substitutional diffusion anymore. And you get a microstructure that looks very, very much finer than, than, uh, than perlite. It's very difficult to see where the carbide is, there's, the carbide is also there. It's also a constituent uh, that's a mixture of ferrite and uh, cementite, yes? But it's more, uh, the cementite is extremely small, yes? So it, 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 it doesn't have a um, lamellar structure anymore. Okay, so this is this this microstructure here. Now, either one of these structures, whether it's bainite or uh, ferrite, um, neither one is a, a stable microstructure. The, um, the stable microstructure is one uh, where you would keep the temperature, yes, keep the temperature constant, yes, do the transformation, and then wait long enough for the equilibrium microstructure, the, the lowest energy microstructure to be formed. And if you do this, and it does take a lot of time, many hours at this particular time, what you form is what we, we call spheroidite, spheroidite. And this is the microstructure. It's, it's actually a ferrite matrix with globules, little circular uh, particles 
of uh, cementite. And the reason why um, you get, you, you transform these, um, this lamellar structure of of um, perlite to uh, spheroidite is because it has much less surface energy. Yes? And that's, that's the reason why the, the, the perlitic microstructure is a high energy um, configuration, if you want, yeah? in comparison to the, the spheroidite. Yeah? And here you have lots of surfaces, yes? lots of interfaces, and so that's basically the driving force for the formation of this um, uh, spheroidite. Yeah? A reduction of the interfacial area. Okay, so this is a good time to uh, to stop. Yeah. Twelve uh, fifteen. Let's let's stop here and. Uh